Hello friends, welcome back to DIY Guitar Making here in my shop at Eric Schaefer Guitars. We're going to do Q&A today. You know what? I'm not even going to bother you with any housekeeping or anything like that. You already know what I'm going to say. Just buy my stuff. That's it. Buy things from me. Buy anything and everything. And buy early and buy often. That's it. Okay. At EricSchaferGuitars.com. Uh... Let's go into the Discord. Let's read your questions and comments. Uh, let's see what we got. So, Patrick writes, This just arrived today. Sinker Redwood. When I sprayed it with water, wow, it stinks like it was in a river for a hundred years. All right. <laughs> Ooh, that looks nice. Oh, LC Guitars calls it Stinker Redwood. That's cute. I like that. So, uh, yeah, if you guys haven't ever been on the Discord platform before, they have all these... Uh, buttons for adorable little emojis that go on there, which if, if it's your first time on there, you're like, what is this for children? But it's actually pretty fun. I like those. They're, they're cute. All right, moving on. Owl Lush, actually, along those lines, he asks, what are the most bad smelling woods? It's an interesting question to ask. I would answer that with zebra wood. I mean, that's the worst smelling wood that I've ever personally dealt with. I've heard somebody else describe it as smelling like a wet dog, and I would agree with that. Wet dog. All right, David Schiff has a question about mineral spirits. He's asking, has mineral spirits changed? David writes, I've built nine guitars since taking Eric's online course, using his true oil finishing method with increasingly good results until the ninth one, that is. After finishing and buffing out, I noticed there was a whitish haze in the finish. I'm puzzled. Didn't think I did anything differently. I have good humidity control. Then I remembered that I had, as of number nine, run out of the 10-year-old gallon of mineral spirits I used on the first eight guitars. Instead, I used paint thinner, which upon a little research I found is not quite the same thing as mineral spirits. I do think I observed that it evaporates more slowly than the old mineral spirits. So I resolved to make sure I used mineral spirits going forward. But then I found that in New York, where I live, the only mineral spirits you can buy is quote-unquote odorless mineral spirits, which from what I can gather has a lower VOC level. I am guessing this would also evaporate more slowly. I didn't have any of this new stuff to experiment with, but I did try experimenting with cutting true oil with naphtha, and this looks promising. Anyone have any thoughts on what might have caused the haze on number nine? Any experience cutting true oil with odorless mineral spirits or naphtha? Okay, um, this is a great question. There's a lot in here, and sometimes sourcing solvents is difficult. And getting specifically the right thing is very, very important when you're talking about cutting, mixing something with something else, okay? Mineral spirits is already in true oil. So thinning it with mineral spirits, you're not adding something new to that proprietary blend. So that's why we use mineral spirits to cut it. So I would be, I'm not saying you can't use naphtha, but I would... I wouldn't really, um, uh, I wouldn't experiment with in that direction because it, it's not already in there. So he mentions the odorless thing being something new or different in his case, but actually for me, I've always bought the same can of odorless mineral spirits. Uh, maybe not always, but uh, you know, this, this still works for me. One thing you can do, there is somewhere on here, here we go, in, in this case, they everything's being updated now with QR codes, right? That's like the new thing. You can follow that QR code, or even if you just search online for Jasco Odorless Mineral Spirits Data Safety Sheet, or is it uh, Ma Material Safety Data Sheet, MSDS, you will find a number or a list of numbers which will give you the exact ingredients in this product and then you can compare that compare jasco odorless mineral spirits with whatever brand you're using and if that number on the msds is the same then it is literally the same thing okay so that's a great way to go about it uh let's see what else did he say here so he wants to cut it with naphtha he was getting a haze which sounds like you're getting moisture 
underneath the finish. It's possible that doesn't even have to do with, although it sounds like it does have to do with um, the, the different, yeah, because he, he wasn't having this problem before and then he, he changed to a new product. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna say. I'm just gonna say, go ahead, uh, Google Jasco Odorless Mineral Spirits MSDS and look up that material safety data sheet. Make sure that whatever product you're using is the same. The odorless part isn't the problem though. Yeah, paint thinner is definitely different from mineral spirits. Uh, it's a big confusing world out there with solvents and some solvents have, even though they're the same thing, will have different names. It, it gets real confusing. Patrick writes, this is what I will use to glue purfling to my binding. It's just two aluminum angles clamped together. The spring clamps put pressure on the binding and the C clamps keep the aluminum from tilting. I cut a six foot piece in half, total cost about $20 and I can use the aluminum for other things when I'm done. Yeah, that looks great. So he's got a picture of that there. You know, all you need is, is pressure inward and something to keep it from shearing and sliding upward when it's under pressure and it looks like this this does the job here i'll show you guys what i use not to take away from what he's showing there so i have two of these jigs it is really just a joining board like you would join the plates with but it's very long and skinny and then there's a shim board that gets wedged. This is this is wedge shaped and it gets wedged in there to create the pressure that we need. Um, and then you would just trap your binding piece and your purfling that you want to stick to it in here. And all the while we have packaging tape in here to protect the uh, to keep our pieces from being permanently glued to the jig itself. So there's lots of cool ways to do that. And if you, you know, put your head to it, you can come up with uh, something creative like what Patrick has there. Oh, we skipped the question of the week. My bad. Yeah, and this was a great one. Okay. Wow, we got so many answers. Okay, awesome. The question of the week, very relevant right now is, what is your favorite resource for tool, tools and or wood and parts outside of Stu Mac? And this is a very relevant question because LMI is closing. If you didn't see my last video or Q&A video uh, where I talked about LMI is closing, it's a big deal and it's a big problem <laughs> in the guitar making community. Patrick writes, I don't think there are any one-stop shop places except, except for Stu Mac. Yeah, he's kind of right about that. And then he includes some resources, though. He said, here's some nice wood at woodjointstudiostops.com. Okay. LC Guitars includes alaskawoods.com for tops. Yep, that's Alaska Specialty Woods. They're a good supplier. Back inside's Hearn Hardwoods. Those are my favorite people. They're um, about an hour and a half away from me. I visit them quite frequently. If you listen to this, you've probably heard me talk about them a couple times. Allied Lou 3 is a big one. They're a good company. No one comes close to what LMI was doing, not even remotely close, but I think when we piece together all these suppliers, hopefully we can make it work. Of course, there is still Stu Mac. They are still there. It's just nice to have lots of uh, alternatives, right? Okay, neck blanks, tops, backsides, bridge blanks, fretboards, Hibden hardwood. You know, I've never used Hibden. I'm very aware of them, but I've, I've never used them myself. I should check them out. American specialty hardwoods, I don't know them. Music woods, tone woods, billets, okay. And then Philadelphia Luthier Tools and Supplies. I need to check them out because they're in Philadelphia. Uh, and I'm a Pennsylvania guy, so. Eric, maybe you can create a separate page for users to post suppliers along with reviews. That's a good idea. I'm going to do that, LC Guitars. I like that. Thank you. Chops13 writes, I get truss rods at bitterrootguitars.com. Okay. Yeah, truss rods are a big problem right now because a lot of people were getting their truss rods solely from LMI. Uh, they had, I was getting them solely from LMI, so it's a problem for me. So, uh, yeah, everyone's kind of scrambling right now to find sources for the things that they were only getting from LMI. So that's great. I'm going to check that out. Bitterroot Guitars. 
Alalush writes, in Europe, Madeiras in Spain for most of the tone woods, necks, etc. Okay, and that's madeirasbarber.com slash tonewood. All right. And Bosnia for maple, one of the best of Europe. Oh, that's interesting. Bosnian tone woods. All right. So all of these links are in the members forum, by the way. If you're a member, go check out the members forum and you can get to all these links. All right, and like LC Guitars said, I might consolidate them in one place for people and include uh, some extra links, ones that I'm aware of as well. Okay, LC Guitars writes, what method do you use to carve your necks? What tools do you use? And then he gives um, what he does. He writes, I cut my necks to the desired width before attaching the fretboard. Next, I measure and cut the thickness, top of fretboard to back of neck, with bandsaw, and then straighten it up to the line with a Shinto saw rasp. That, by the way, is this beautiful rasp right here. This is also one of my favorite tools. Uh, sometimes they sell them with this little handle on here, which is sort of useless for neck carving, but it's there. Um, sometimes they sell it without. You don't need that little handle. But anyway, that is a fantastic tool. You can see it's kind of like this grid pattern, so it's very open, so it sheds material and doesn't clog, get clogged up very easily. That's sort of the genius of that design. Continuing with what he was saying, Shinto Rasp, I then use the faceting technique of dividing the neck into a series of angles and removing them with the Shinto Rasp. After about five divisions, the neck is starting to get a close shape. From there, it's all feel for me and the finer side of the Shinto. All the while, I use a few smaller files to do the transition at the headstock and heel. I then use a 6 to 8 inch long flat block with some 120 grit paper and go up and down the neck to even everything out before using the loop of paper like Eric demonstrates in his video. So what he's talking about is using sandpaper held taut at the sides. I use 40 grit Velcro backed sandpaper. It doesn't have to be Velcro backed. It's just, I already have this sandpaper for my drum sander because it's a Velcro drum set, Velcro drum. And uh, because I already have this material, I do find that no backing is stronger than this Velcro back. It holds together so nice and it's nice and soft on your thumbs. So it's perfect as a tool Whereas if I just use regular non-cloth backed or Velcro backed sandpaper, it'll tear all the time and you'll just go through lots of paper in a single job. So yeah, if you have some Velcro backed or cloth backed sandpaper in the shop, you just hold it taut at the sides and you can really clean up and level out any inconsistencies. Everything out before using the loop of paper like Eric demonstrates, I sand up to 320, that way while sanding the transitions, I have found having the back of the neck at close to final thickness really speeds up the process and provides a very even taper from first to 12th fret for me. I do pretty much the same on my acoustics, but takes about an hour longer with the larger heel and the volute I like to do. Both of these necks took about one hour and 15 to an hour and 30 from bandsaw to the first coat of trill. Wow, that is, honestly, that is really fast. I take a really long time. I don't do electric guitars, so mine are all acoustics, but, so he said it takes him about an hour more than that, so he's saying mm, two, two hours and 15 minutes to two hours and 30 minutes for an acoustic. I definitely take longer than that for my acoustics. Good on you, that's a really speedy process. Uh, and very similar to what I do, so I'm, I'm, I don't really have much to add to that or anything to add to that. Okay, well thank you for sharing that, and hopefully some other people share what they do too. Yeah, neck carving is uh, the kind of thing where it's, it's very involved, it truly is an act of sculpture, so it's very personal to each person how they go about doing it. It's the hardest thing for me to teach as a teacher. I struggle with it because it's the one thing that, maybe not the one thing, but it's one of those things that I can't teach in a linear, sequential fashion, like do this step, you know, bring the heel down, then do the shaft, then do the cheeks. It doesn't work like that. Everything has to be coming down sort of 
in equilibrium, in tandem at the same time. So you do a little bit of work on the shaft, a little bit of work on the cheeks. You're constantly paying attention to adjacent areas so you don't let one area get too far away from you, right? Like if I get the cheeks too developed while the heel and the, the shaft are still very undeveloped, uh, it's gonna be a problem. It's gonna be hard to blend those areas together. So it's more art than craft, if that makes sense. It truly is. Sculpture, it really is an act of sculpture. All right guys, let's check out YouTube and see what you guys have to say on YouTube. Rick DV writes, another big problem with Gibson one piece necks is the grain run out at the headstock angle. So what he's talking about is in the previous video, I was talking about these 17, I think it's 17 degree headstock angles of old Gibsons and how they would break all the time. Everybody's kind of aware of this, you know, Gibson's notorious for that. So that's the context with behind his comment. He says, another big problem with Gibson one piece necks is the grain run out at the headstock angle. And then right at the point of greatest torque from the string tension, Gibson carves out a big trough for access to the truss rod nut, further weakening the wood there. It's no wonder Gibson necks often break there. I've got an old mid fifties LG that was my dad's and the neck broke there twice. It's still in pieces, plus there are other problems. Yeah, so that's a common problem. It's, it's a reason to do volutes. It's why people do a volute on the back is because they're routing out that excess area for access to the truss rod at the headstock end. Of course, as many of you know, you can set up your truss rods so that they adjust from inside the sound hole or so that they adjust from the headstock end. There's a convenience factor to having it at the headstock end, of course. You don't have to kind of loosen up strings and awkwardly get in through the sound hole, but you are weakening your scarf joint, which some people compensate for by adding a volute, and some people don't. I mean, some people just assume it's not gonna be a problem, kind of like we're talking about here with Gibson, and uh, their necks are just more of a liability. But I'd say the proper thing to do is to have a volute behind that weakened area but he's right he's right about everything he said i'm not you know i'm actually i'm just agreeing with everything he said <laughs> and adding something to it so that's very good karma charms kittens karma charms kittens great name <laughs> you know it's, that sounds like one of those like um video mill sites like you know you just create uh kitten videos and flood the internet with them but maybe they just like cats. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm gonna stop yammering. She, he writes, whoever it is writes, LMI, broken heart <laughs> emoji. Great resource and customer service. I am sorry to hear they are closing up shop. I always found tools and materials and useful jigs at very affordable prices. Yeah, it is super sad. This is what, a, you know, this is echoing a lot of the sentiment of a lot of people right now. DALG Guitars writes, LMI gone. I live close. I would pick up stuff at the warehouse after ordering. This breaks my heart. Someone writes, I called LMI today and asked them about closing. The rep I talked to confirmed that they are in fact closing their doors. He said that the owners felt it was time to call it quits. He said they're working on finding someone to buy them out. So hopefully we will not lose this valuable resource uh that's interesting i don't know i don't know if i'm buying that <laughs> they've uh sold a lot already it does seem like they're they're truly just retiring and getting rid of all their equipment and you know clearing out all the all of their warehouses and everything it would be awesome if someone if that's true and someone's actually if they're trying to find a buyer right now. And it's truly shocking to me why someone isn't buying them out. It's the competitor to Stu Mac, really. It's, they're almost as big as Stu Mac. So the fact that they're just liquidating everything and going away is shocking. It truly is shocking that they're not selling. Crazy news, the whole community is in shock, yes. I bought up a bunch of the reverse curved linings and was disappointed that the side benders were already gone. Yeah, 
A lot of people like those side benders. And yeah, I use, I forgot about the reverse curved linings. That's what I use. So reading this comment, I'm just realizing that I'm gonna have to do a little bit of perusing on the internet to get myself set up again with a different supplier. But I don't think that'll be hard to find. A lot of people make curfing, maybe not reverse curfing, but there's a lot of sources for different types of curfing, traditional curfing, reverse curfing, solid linings. GMC writes, hey brother, found your channel today, already learned a few things, so you're my fifth Luthier channel subscription. Cool. I might be old and slow, but I get there in the end. Thanks for taking the time and the hard work it takes to share. It's nice to see the dedication for inspiration as motivation because all I see is potential. Not sure I understand that, but th thank you. Um, sounds very positive and nice, and I, I tr truly appreciate that. Okay, there's, <laughs> there's like no questions. It's all comments. Jonah Guitar Guy writes, touching back to the previous video about repairing cheap guitars, I built my repair chops on cheap guitars. Even though I was doing them for free or very reasonably, I learned a lot about how things work. Neck resets, refrets, and crack repair and finish repairs. It's all scary even on a cheap instrument. The first actual dovetail reset was on a 1950 00018, butt pucker to the max but way easier than the no-name 12-string that had been dowel-pinned and epoxied. Ugh. Yeah, that's, well, that's interesting. I find that to be very true as well, what he said about it's scary uh, even on, on a cheap instrument. It is funny when you're doing repairs, unless you have some you know, historic restoration, some one-of-a-kind thing, I, I feel just as nervous doing repairs, maybe not just as nervous, but almost as nervous doing repairs on a cheap instrument as on an expensive instrument because either way to that customer relative to their pocketbook it feels the same right if you hand it back and it's not an impressive repair just that kind of that look on their face when they're of disappointment is terrible either way i find so Oh, good. Here's a response to one of my questions of the week from earlier, which I didn't really get responses on. Mr. BT Cruiser writes, recently enlarging a hole on an aluminum plate with a drill press without clamping it down. The bit dug in, spun the plate, and tore off a small corner of my thumb. Ugh. It could have been a lot worse. Lesson learned, always clamp down what you are drilling on the drill press and wear leather gloves. It is always the stupid things that you know better that get you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've never done that to myself, but I absolutely could have done that several times. It's interesting because the drill press is a seemingly benign tool. It's not a scary tool, but the ways in which it can be dangerous sneak up on you, right? They're not obvious. So what he's talking about actually Got a, I'm gonna use this as an example, this little cutout from a sound hole. He said he was drilling a hole in a aluminum plate and you know, you might only have that bit spinning at 300 RPM or 500 RPM or, well, I guess he's drilling through metal so he's probably gonna have it up pretty fast. Let's just say he's drilling at 1000 RPM. So it might be spinning 1000 RPM right in the center where you're actually drilling and so you're watching this thing spin at a speed that is reasonable to you, but what you, what you don't necessarily intuit at the time is that if that catches the speed of the object, once it catches, is going to be dependent on how, on the diameter of that object, right? So the speed here is 1000 RPMs, but the speed out here on the edge is going to be much, much greater. And if you had an even larger object, then that leverage, that speed uh, is going to be extreme. It's going to, and it's going to be extremely dangerous. So that is the way that drill presses sneak up on you. But yeah, either way, regardless of the size, I mean, he had a plate of aluminum and I'm sure that aluminum had some scraggly sharp edges too. That can really hurt you. Anyway, thank you for sharing that. Hopefully that helps someone out there clamp things down as, as much as you can and be safe. Be safe out there.
Okay, you know what? I'm going to end it there. Kind of a short one today. Um, I appreciate all you guys. I'll see you in the next q and I've got a bunch more videos coming up on the parlor guitar build. Actually, uh, that guitar right at this second is finally in the finishing room, and it has its first coat of finish on. So, home stretch, baby. Okay, I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye for now. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania. <laughs>